looking at the third and fifth chapters in the Bronson et al. textbook, and it's mainly the third chapter that this is based upon, looking at this notion of models, theories, and frameworks, which is really the focus of both textbooks for this week. Looking specifically at these three terms, one of the things that you want to think back to is your science classes from junior high and high school that you took where we looked at how essentially something becomes a theory or scientific law or those types of things. Because this is basically the same process, just applied to a research standpoint. Here we've got three definitions for theories, models, and frameworks. And actually, I'll take them from the bottom first, looking at frameworks first. Frameworks essentially are descriptive outline or process that describes how a system or how something will actually work out in practice. So if you expect something to do A, then it does B, and then it does C, that's a framework. So if you think of like an assembly line that you might have, so if you've ever visited the Jelly Belly factory there, you know, they go through the um, the syrup gets things added to it till it gets sticky. That's one step in the framework. And then it spins through that thing, which actually makes it more in the size of a, a gummy or a, a gummy type substance. And then it, that's the next step. And then it gets shot into like a mold. So it actually turns into like this bean looking like thing. That's the next step. And then it goes into this cylindrical thing that looks like a cement mixer that spins it really quickly with a bunch of sugar and stuff in there that gives it sort of the shine and the polish. That's the next step. That's a framework. So it's a structure or an overview that this thing is going to go through this, then this. So it's descriptive in nature. The other two are more um, involved in what you would consider the scientific process. So the, a model basically is how specific variables will interact in a specific situation. So when it comes to research, models are often developed when you see specific variables that will interact or will undertake the same process time and time again. So if you do X to this particular variable, it will always do Y, but if you do A to it, it will do B. So it gives you sort of a, 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 a you can almost see it in like a chart type thing where you get these if then statements. If this happens, then this happens. And if, but if this happens, then something else happens. And a model is the first step in terms of the scientific process when you're looking at trying to put together a rationale for why something happens. So a model tends to be a simplification and oftentimes an oversimplification of what will happen in certain circumstances. Once that model has been tested a sufficient number of times and it acts in a predictable fashion each time that it has been tested, then you can start to generate a theory as to why those things are starting to happen. Um, so a theory is basically, essentially, it's a predictive model to be at its base the, uh, at its base function or its base value. And a theory is something that, at least at this stage, happens in each instance that we have done it, but we haven't proven it to be absolutely true. Because once we prove it to be absolutely true, then it becomes a scientific law. So something is a theory until it's actually... Uh, it, it, it can be proven. So and if you think back to your scientific model that you would have had in high school, when we've got a theory, we don't try to prove our hypothesis. We try to disprove the null hypothesis. So if we want something to happen, the null hypothesis is always that nothing will happen. And if something happens, then we've disproven the null hypothesis. So we've essentially disproven that nothing will happen because something did happen. 
very rarely within the scientific model do we actually get to the point where we've proven something will happen every single time under every single instance where these particular variables are uh, put together in a specific way. But that's what the goal is. And that specific way is what you would have outlined in your theory, which would have been developed from an initial model that was designed based upon how we noticed particular variables interacting with each other um, when we first started doing research. So you've got this kind of process and the reason why you want to have these three things or any one of these three things is because it provides a standardization for what it is you're doing. So if you are acting within a specific framework for your evidence-based practice or for your translational research or for, for that matter, your empirical research if you were a bench researcher, that process, because it's a standardized process, could be duplicated and replicated. And that way it allows for people to determine whether or not the outcomes that you had from that process were just chance or was it actually something that was noticed by um, the actual research process that was actually caused by the research process. So that's why you would want to do these particular things. So when you're looking at using a theory or a model or a framework, essentially what you're looking to do again, is come up with that standardized model so that if I did it in my hospital using this particular framework, then you should be able to use the exact same framework at your hospital and determine whether or not your outcomes are the same as mine. And if your outcomes are the same as mine, then what we have in terms of an intervention is likely going to be a successful intervention. Whereas if you and I end up with different outcomes, even though we've gone through the same process, then we have to start looking a little bit deeper to see what are the variables that were inconsistent between your setting and my setting. Um, what about your context was different than my context that might have accounted for the differences in our outcome. So that's really the, what you want to think of when you're looking at how we use these uh, a particular theory or a particular model or a particular framework. To look at the rest of specifically chapter three in the Bronson textbook, I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Clavo Hall again and, and insert a section from a lecture that she recorded in one of the previous sessions of this course. Last week, we looked at one definition of uh, translational research. This week, we're looking at the NIH's definition of uh, translational research. And as you can see, it's the process of applying discoveries generated during research in the lab and preclinical studies and developing uh, the trials in the studies so that they can be moved to human trials and see how they work. And the aim is to enhance the adoption of best practices in the community. And that's where we have the gap, what we found to be uh, successful in some laboratory ex experience or experiments and how do we translate that into go moving to things like uh, human trials. You have the NIH and they started out with two types of research and we've talked about this a lot but I want to make sure that we're remembering it started out with type one applying the discoveries made in the lab. That's type one. And then it, I had type two, and that's where you said you're enhancing the adoption uh, so that you can uh, use the best practices on humans. This what translational research started out as. These were the only two types at one time in the very beginning. So now that we're talking about from zero to four on the uh, transition, translational research continuum, it was not always the four of them. So I know that in some of your uh, individual responses, you talked a lot about, uh, well, we had T1 and then we had T2, and that is true, but know that T2 has evolved into something 
much more involved now that we're on the continuum. Mm -hmm. And then we have this, uh, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, the T1 phase of uh, the uh, AHRQ project. And its purpose was to generate the new knowledge and practice that would work in diverse uh, settings. And that is where they're trying to bring those best practices from bench research into real world settings where you have less control over the human environment, the human resources. And then they had uh, trip two, and that focused on applying and assessing the strategies and methods that we developed. And then we've talked a bit about innovation. And with innovation, we'll be talking about this quite a bit more. Is it new to the people that you're taking it to? So it could be as much as taking it from Kaiser to Alameda County Hospital. If they've never done it before, never worked with it, never seen it, it can be an innovation in that particular environment. And these are characteristics or attributes that you would look at, okay? And then uh, looking at diffusion of innovation, we'll be looking at this more. Everett Rogers, one of the major contributors to diffusion of innovation. So with that, I'm actually going to Stop for now uh, with diffusion of innovation and Rogers and looking at the rates of adoption. Well, the Bronson textbook focuses primarily upon the Rogers model for diffusions of innovations. One of the things that you'll see in the white textbook in the next presentation is that there are several other frameworks and models that can be used to consider how a intervention or a new practice gets diffused throughout an organization. So looking back at the chapters in Bronson, a couple of things that you want to note. Um, the first is the stressing that the authors have about the fact that more and more we are seeing the use of theories, models, and frameworks in translational research, and that shows some of the maturity that is starting to happen in the field because it's starting to use these more standardized approaches. The second thing that they emphasize is that when you're looking at the um, evaluation of an approach for transferring research to practice, it requires an interdisciplinary notion and the fact that you're using things like Rogers Diffusions of Innovation, which actually um, is a theory from outside of nursing and many of the models that you see in the, the white textbook that will come up in the next, uh, the next uh, presentation are also ones that have been adopted or adapted for use within the healthcare sector, but weren't actually originated in the healthcare sector. Uh, the final thing that the authors stress is that the approach to minimize the research to practice gap, when you're looking at the different approaches that are there, regardless if it's the Rogers model or any of these others, they're not mutually exclusive. So similar to the different models of translational research that we were looking at, in the initial chapters of both of these textbooks where you could categorize many of the steps that you found within each of the models that were there within this larger framework. If you remember the white textbook in chapter one had those six steps that it said that all of the models of translational research fell into. And similarly with in the field of education, there were those five phases that you found in all of the instructional design models that are out there. The same is true when you're looking at many of these models and frameworks that have been used to standardize translational research and evidence-based practice that many of them have these overlaps amongst them so that the various stages or steps or phases 
are consistent from one model to another. So they're not mutually exclusive of each other. So that brings us to the end of this presentation. As always, if you have any questions, feel free to send me an email or post them in the support and questions discussion area.